Blue Monday by New Order is one of the most iconic songs from the 1980s. At the time, its groundbreaking fusion of post-punk and electronic dance music was frankly, unheard of, and it ignited dance floors that had stagnated in the aftermath of disco. It would go on to become the top-selling 12-inch single of all time, an achievement it still holds to this day. This is the story of Blue Monday, and how the song came about pretty much by mistake. I mean, you know, it, it's insane. Blue Monday is an insane tune. After the death of Ian Curtis in 1980, Joy Division continued without their former frontman, changing their name to New Order, with Joy Division guitarist and keyboardist Bernard Sumner taking over on vocals. There was also Peter Hook on bass and Stephen Morris on drums, the other two remaining members of Joy Division. Sumner would ultimately give up his keyboard duties to Gillian Gilbert, later that year. The band quickly became a cornerstone of their flagship Manchester label, Factory Records, and its nightclub, The Hacienda, which led to the band exploring more and more electronic instrumentation and dance rhythms in their music. Roughly 18 months after Curtis's death in May of 1980, New Order released their debut album in the fall of 1981. That was followed by Power, Corruption, and Lies in 1983. And that's the year the band released Blue Monday. The beginning of Blue Monday is iconic, not just in having an enormously memorable beat, but in that it's pretty much entirely looped through electronics. I saw Blue Monday more of a, of a, of a, a machine and the different rhythms within it are different gear cogs. For the drums, an Oberheim DMX drum machine was used. For the synth melodies, they used a Moog source, pushed through a sequence were built by Sumner himself. Then there was the addition of an early sampler, the Emulator 1, pulling in sounds from Kraftwerk's Uranium. Despite how serious and precise the music sounds at face value on Blue Monday, the band itself was a little off kilter. Remember, they came from the dark, grimy ashes of Joy Division. For example, Stephen Morris taught himself to use the sampler by spending hours and hours and hours recording the band's flatulence. It's from this mentality that Blue Monday was born. And that brings us to an excuse to drink. Cheers. So the story goes like this. In the early 1980s, New Order did not like to play encores. They absolutely hated it. So as they're exploring with this new equipment and these electronic sounds, they came up with an idea. Well, rather than playing an encore, what if they just slipped away and had a few drinks while the music continued to play without them? I mean, with the homemade sequencer and the drum machine and sampler, they could essentially loop various things together and wouldn't even have to be on stage. So Morris dropped a beat on his Oberheim DMX, and that alone is danceable. But it can only go on for so long, so Sumner came up with the idea of using his homemade sequencer to trigger a subtle, melodic intro from Jillian Gilbert's synthesizer. Again, more delay, before bringing in one of Peter Hook's bass lines. Surely they could get a few drinks in before coming back to the stage, right? I mean, no one would know the difference, especially if the lights were dimmed for the intro. This could literally go on for minutes because, well, it's a dance floor and it's a cool beat. They could slip away at the beginning, let the electronics do the heavy lifting, have a drink or two, and be back and people would be none the wiser. If you think that's the end of the story, you're, you're wrong. Very wrong. With the framework of a new song, crafted and triggered entirely by machines, New Order entered the studio, and that's where the story continues. As the legend goes, when New Order took the song into the studio one day, they were kind of loaded up on acid with nothing much for them to really do except push a few buttons and kick back, you know, minus maybe a little melody here and some vocals there, the people in the studio, the engineers and producers and whomever else might have been there, uh, told them to go away. 
We want to work. Go away. Like, there's a cafe down there. Go check that out or something. And that allowed the engineers and the producers and whomever else there was just get down to work. And because this was essentially filler to go between their set and this so-called encore, it didn't land on an actual album. Instead, it was only released as a whopping eight-minute song on a 12-inch single. And that single changed the face of alt-rock as we know it, forging a connection between rock music and dance music. Ultimately, that 12-inch would become, as I mentioned, the number one selling 12-inch single of all time. And the next part of this story might come as a little shock. So to wrap things up, we gotta look at the packaging. It's one of those things that we just wrote it and it sounded good and people liked it and bought it without any promotion. So here's an interesting aside. Despite this being the number one selling 12 inch single of all time, the band actually lost money on every single sale of the record. Apparently the artwork by graphic designer Peter Seville and Brett Reckins was so expensive to produce. Because of that phenomenal artwork, you actually made a loss, but I think it was 10p for every record sold, right? Yeah, Pete Saville was really amused. As Steve Morris quite rightly says, the money, the cost of it, was the bits that you didn't get. So the punch took the thing away, and it was that die punching. And we didn't find out until we'd sold 200,000 copies. The original sleeve is die cut and made to look like a floppy disk. And for you youngins, that's what was used to store files before CD-ROMs. And if you don't know what a CD-ROM is, well, it's kind of like a music CD, but it stored files. Kind of like a thumb drive these days for your computer. And if you don't know what a thumb drive is, I, I can't help you there. As for the floppy disk, I'm not talking about any old floppy disk. It was the five and a quarter inch one. That's what was used before the 3.5 inch floppy disk, which wasn't really all that floppy. So future pressings of Blue Monday, like this copy right here from 1988, feature different artwork. So the band could maybe make a little bit of money. And that is the story of Blue Monday. Next, let's hop across the pond to a little town called Athens in a state called Georgia in the United States, where I recount how Peter Buck landed the guitar that not only changed the sound of R.E.M., but alt-rock in general. Hint, it has to do with a horribly failed attempt at flirting with a woman in a see-through shirt. I am Andy, this is the Fence Post Vinyl Channel, and I'll see you in the next video.